Those of you my age and older, 28, (laughs) early 40s, I want you to think about times when you would visit Grandma and Grandpa's church when you were a little kid. Was it anything like what I remember? You'd walk in, and it was classic old-school church. The narthex was just tiny. And then you'd walk into the sanctuary, and it was super high ceilings and stained glass everywhere. And as you walked in, you noticed there was a general cold feeling. I mean, part of it was actual cold because the cheap krauts were too cheap to actually turn the heat on. But it was almost just kind of an emotional kind of coldness. The opening hymn would start, and there'd be very little singing. You'd look over and some of the old farmers would maybe just be even mouthing the words. And church, other than that, was absolutely silent. If a baby was sucking on a bottle too loudly, a horrified mother would race to the back. And then the pastor would stand up and it seemed like he never smiled. He always had a stern look on his face and almost kind of looked angry throughout the entire service. And then when it was all said and done, it's as if there was a contest to see who could get to their car and get out of the parking lot the fastest. Now, for some of you, you may think, I don't remember anything like that, but others, I can see you nodding your heads like, that was my grandparents' church to a T. So, looking back on that, what do you think of that? Does a part of you think, wow, that was a pretty joyless group? Does another another part of you say, well, sure, improvements could be made, but maybe we could learn something from that generation? Church has gotten a little too relaxed these days. Or is there a middle ground? All those questions can be summed up with one more question. What should a church service look like? And by the end, I hope you understand how important it is that we keep asking and answering that question. And to answer that question, we're focusing on our reading from Nehemiah. We'll go through it in a second. But since we rarely have sermons from this book, you need to know the setting. For many years prior to this, the Israelites had been worshiping false gods and pushing the true God away. And he told them, if you do not repent and come back to me, bad things are going to happen. Well, they didn't repent and bad things did happen. As promised, the Babylonians came in, essentially leveled Jerusalem, and took a great majority of the people back to Babylon in captivity. It was bad. But the whole point of this was an act of love. God wanted the people to see their sin and to repent, to come back to him. And it worked. So after 70 years, those promised 70 years, God allowed people to start coming back. And like we said, Jerusalem was in ruin, so they had to rebuild everything. And one of the things they had to rebuild was a wall around the outside to keep them safe. Nehemiah, at this time, he was in Babylon. He had a cushy job as an attendant. But he leaves and he comes to Jerusalem to basically be the mayor. And one of the first things he has to do is to construct that wall. It was not easy. There were enemies trying to stop it. There were supply problems. There were politics. But in a relatively short time, they got the wall up. And for the first time in a long time, Jerusalem had some security. So with this all said and done, what does Nehemiah do? He holds a worship service. So let's start working our way through this. And we're going to build on the definition every different section we look at. So they're thankful that they were able to construct the wall. And our our text starts, All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. So already we have an answer, at least a partial one, to our question. What should a church service look like? A group of appreciative people. They got the wall done. They were safe. God allowed them to do that and kept their enemies off their backs. They were a group of thankful, appreciative people. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So what should a church service look like? Not just a group of people gathered, but a group of appreciative people gathered around the word. They tell Ezra the high priest, come, share God's word with us. They wanted to hear it. Because that was the foundation of everything they taught and they believed group of appreciative people gathered around God's word. Keep going. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Now there's a lot in there. But I want you to focus on that last line. They listened 
attentively. This was no small feat because Ezra basically read for six straight hours. Makes you realize you shouldn't complain at a 65-minute service, right? Right. But as he was reading, the people were dialed in. They were focused. They were taking it to heart. They were actively listening as the word was being preached. So what should a church service look like? A group of appreciative people gathered around the word, listening attentively to it. Verses 5 and 6. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. One word to pull from this section would be reverence. The people knew they were coming before God and there was a, there was a reverence. There was a respect. As Ezra stood up to read the word, the people did too, just like we do during the gospel lesson. As Ezra was sharing that word, people were shouting their agreement and saying, Amen. And then when it was all said and done, the people get in about the humblest position on their knees, bowed down before the Lord. This wasn't out of fear or anything like that. This was respect. This was reverence. So what should a church service look like? A group of appreciative people gathered around the word, listening attentively to it with reverence. On we go. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Why were they weeping? Well, as they heard the word, they realized there were things they were supposed to be doing that they weren't doing. That's a sin. They also realized there were things they were doing that they shouldn't have been doing. That's a sin as well. The people were cut to the heart. Their consciences bothered them, and so they were crying. And those tears were an outward manifestation of the sorrow that was in their heart. They knew they were wrong. But notice what Nehemiah and Ezra call the Almighty. They call him the Lord. Best definition of that is the God of free and faithful love. Had the people rebelled against God, turned on him, deserted him? Yes. But the God of free and faithful love would not let them go. He kept bringing them back. He kept forgiving them all because he loved them. And because of that truth, Nehemiah says, look, don't be filled with despair. Don't be sad. Don't cry. Instead, rejoice because the Lord is your God. So what should a church service look like? A group of appreciative, joyous people gathered around the word, listening attentively to it with reverence. And one more thing will add to it. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah didn't want this to be a one-and-done kind of thing. Like, okay, we have this worship service, but let's all go home and forget about it. No, he wanted the people to take what they had heard and learned and carry it with them throughout the week. He wanted, as he says, the joy of the Lord, all that he's done, to be their strength, to be their guide until they gathered again for worship. So now we have our final definition. What should a church service look like? A group of appreciative, joyous people, gathered around the Word, listening attentively to it with reverence, who take those appreciative, joyous hearts with them as they head out to praise God in their daily lives. Now, I know that's a mouthful, and I know you can't memorize that, but just focus on the key words. Appreciative, joyous, word, attentively, reverence, and taking it with us. That's what a church service looked like back then. The easy question is, is that what... It, should we have that kind of service? Obviously, yes. The more difficult question is, is that what our services regularly look like? Are we always joyous as we come to this place because we understand what we're doing and what is happening here? When we come to this place, do we realize we need to check our personal thoughts and feelings of right and wrong, good and bad at the door and humble ourselves before the Lord and his word? As that word is being read, are we listening attentively? Are we actively listening instead of letting X, Y, and Z go through our minds? 
When we come into this place, is there, is there an amount of reverence, of respect, that here we are meeting the Almighty, we are talking to Him and He is talking to us? Is there a joyous feeling <clears throat> as we come to God's house? And do we take what we hear in this place and carry it throughout the week with us? You can't simply say yes or no to those questions. The honest answers are sometimes yes and sometimes no. Sometimes their services look just like Nehemiah's, sometimes they don't. And why is that? Well, we talk about it all the time. There are two parts of us, the Christian and the sinner. And realize the sinner in us hates everything that happens at this place. Everything we do here is based around God's word, especially around the forgiving love of our Savior. And the sinner in us wants nothing to do with that. So we are tempted to come here out of a sense of obligation or duty or see coming to worship as just one more item on our long list each week of things to check off. I got it done. What's next? We're tempted to come to this place focusing only on our negatives and only on our problems or what we're lacking instead of being truly thankful for what we have. We're tempted to come here and make it all about ourselves. I'm most important. What does all this do for me? We're tempted to zone out, to focus on all the other things that are going on in our brains and let the words go in one ear and out the other. We're tempted to come here and treat this as if it's no different than any other place failing to show reverence in how we conduct ourselves in this place. And so easily we are tempted and give in that we think, okay, well, I got that done, and we just leave everything we talk about. Now, what's going to happen the rest of the week? We are tempted in all these ways, and you know as well as I do how often we fail in that. It's no secret, it's just reality. And that's why it's all the more important that our services continue to look like the one in our lesson. Do we sometimes come here with less than thankful hearts? Absolutely. But what happens when we're here? We're around God's word. And we pray that as we're doing that, the Holy Spirit is opening our eyes. God has blessed us beyond measure in so many ways. But we all know the greatest blessing. It's the fact that in Christ we are forgiven. We are forgiven for all our sins, yes, but keep it specific to, for today. God demands you to be a perfect worshiper, always paying attention, always dialed in, always taking it to heart. None of us can say that that's us. But our Savior went to the cross for those worship sins. And not only did he take the bad, he also gave us the good. Because of Christ's work, it's as if we are, in God's eyes, perfect worshipers, totally dialed in, absolutely attentive. To know that that's how God sees us, even though we are struggling sinners, doesn't that lead us to thankfulness? And when we add that to all the other things, whether it's our, our families, our homes, our jobs, our lives, doesn't that give it every reason for it to be overflowing with thanks when we gather here? We talk about how sometimes we come to this place and we're tempted to make it all about us. But again, what happens when we're here? All the attention is shifted to God. All the attention is shifted to the truth that he sent his son for us. We realize it's not about us, it's about him and what he's done. But when we focus on that, then we realize it is about us. Because he did all those things that we might be able to rest our heads every evening and know that we are forgiven, heaven-bound children of God. When we focus on our Savior, he turns it right back to us and says, this is what I've done for you, because this is my love for you. We said sometimes we come to this place and we have a hard time listening attentively. I get that. But when we're here and we pray again, the Spirit is doing His thing, what do we hear? We hear God telling us absolutely what we need to hear. We hear God speaking to our day-to-day -day problems and issues. Our Lord speaks a word of peace to the young couple who's dealing with the troubled child or, or, or the aged adult who's dealing with a really aged parent. What do we do? God's promise of blessings extends to the person who is right in the midst of a relationship falling apart. God's promise of forgiveness allows us to leave the sins of the past in the past, at the foot of the cross. And God's promise of love allows us to move forward into a future in which we don't know what's going to happen. When we listen attentively and hear what God is saying, we hear him speak every word we need him to speak. We talk about somehow sometimes we struggle with reverence when we come to this place. Well, God, when we're here, God awakens us to the fact that we are speaking 
to the almighty king of heaven and earth, whose power, majesty, and glory is so far beyond anything we can comprehend, we can't even start to put it into words. That should have an awe-filling kind of effect that we'd be allowed to, to be part of him. But then when we realize that that God, who is so much bigger and better and huger than we are, comes down to our level to be with us and bless us, there's awe and there's amazing joy that that is my Lord. That's what he's done for me, and he will always be with me. And that last part about taking it with us. When we gather here, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We are reminded of everything that's been done. We are built up in faith. And that joy not only gets us through the next week, it helps us live the next week with a sense of godly purpose as we serve our Lord and as we serve his people. We talked about that last week. We'll talk about it more next week. Here we are filled up. Think of it like a gas station. We are, we are energized here, reminded of who we are and what's been done for us. And we burn that fuel during the week. The joy of the Lord is our strength during the week. And right when the meter's getting to about empty, we come back to this place and we're filled with that same joy again. I hope you see how important the question is. What should a church service look like? It's not about form. It's not about outward things. It's about the message. It's about the message being preached that speaks to our hearts, that comforts our fears, that calms our minds. And it does all that because it's a message that is completely focused on God's amazing love for us in Christ. So let's ask the question one more time. What should a church service look like? A group of appreciative, joyous people. We're appreciative. We're joyous. A group of appreciative, joyous people gathered around the Word listening attentively to it with reverence, who take those appreciative, joyous hearts with them as they head out to praise God in their daily lives. We thank the Lord for allowing us to have such a service today, and we ask Him to give us the exact same next Sunday. Amen.